Hi, welcome to Community Empowerment. I'm Roberta Martin, your host. Tonight with me in the studio is Minnesota State Senator John Huffman. Tonight we'll be talking about the 2015 legislative report and where we, are, where we have been in the past and where we are going from here. Gentlemen, you're welcome. Nice to see you. My thanks. pleasure, thank you. Thanks for letting me be here. Yes, great, great to see you too. Um, why don't we just go straight into the uh, topic and just first of all start talking about yourself. So just tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Roberta. I, I represent uh, Senate District 36, which is the northern part of Brooklyn Park, so 85th and, and north, all of Champlin and then uh, one fourth of Coon Rapids. And, and uh, in the Senate, I serve as the Vice Chair of Energy and Environment Committee. And I also serve on the Education E12, both the policy and the finance, as well as health, health human services, and housing policy. And I also serve on a subcommittee of Fish and Wildlife, which is part of our energy and environment piece, as well as I'm the chair of the Governor's Developmental Disability Council. And then I serve in rules and administration on both the elections committee and then also personnel. So it's a pretty busy agenda, and I love doing what I'm doing. I see that. That's uh, pretty interesting to hear all these uh, descriptions about yourself. Let's go straight to the question. And I read about your 2015 legislative report, and there were some very interesting things that are in there, and I thought the general public would like to hear about that. So my first question is, in your 2015 legislative report, you said, and I quote, I believe the history books will say the 2015 legislative session was marked by big wings for education. What do you mean by big wings for education? You know, Roberta, as, as we look at, at uh, 2015, it was the first time in many years that we were giving, able to give back to our school districts, both in the, in the early childhood world mm -hmm. and as well as the general education formula world. And it was the third largest in the history of Minnesota when it comes to funding uh, the Minnesota schools. And, and let's go back to 2011-2012. Okay. When, when, when the Republicans were in charge of both the House and the Senate, they said to the school districts, and, and I'm going to take you to a place because I was, uh, the eight years I served as, the, as a school board member in the Anoka Hennepin School District. Okay. And, and they said to us, school districts, they said, we're going to pay you, but we're not going to pay you now. We're going to pay you sometime in the future, so you need to go borrow money. And so what school districts had to do was to borrow money. And in, in the case of Minnesota, it was $2.6 billion was borrowed. That school shifting has happened in the past, but that was done specifically to balance the budget. What that meant for my school district when I was serving as the vice chair was that it was about $83 million that we had to end up borrowing at the end of the day in order to keep our doors open. To me, that's just wrong. You know, if you're going to do it, pay it. Pay it right away. So in 2014, when we got, uh, when I was elected in 2012, 2013, and the 2013-2014 session, um, we actually paid back the schools. That school shift was paid back that first year. That's the first time in the history that anything's been paid back that fast. And then we made some small investments in early childhood education, as well as putting some money on the formula. 2015, it was a, it was a battle, but $87 million in early childhood and 525 in general education formula. That, to me, is a huge win. It sounds like a huge win to me, too, you know, from what you just said about 2014 yep. to where we are right now. And, and the fact is we came from a, a, a tax shifting borrow, mm -hmm. borrow right. as you go. Some school districts, when they borrowed the money, actually went into statutory operating debt, which makes no sense to me either because mm -hmm. here's the kicker. This is public dollars. This is taxpayer Absolutely. dollars that yes. you're giving to your local school district. You're giving to the state to say, give it to the local school districts. And what the state ended up doing in 2011 and 2012 was to say, no, you just go borrow that money. And mm -hmm. so to me, that just made absolutely zero sense. And mm -hmm. that's why I ran in 2012 for the first time was because of that kind of non-responsible uh, work that was done on behalf of taxpayers. I see. Wow, that really is a win-win then. Well, my next question uh, tied up to even what you just said um, concerning that, and that is, in which ways are the school district going to use these dollars to close all this achievement gap? Because you said that the purpose of this is to close the achievement gap. Yep. Um, in your report, that's what I read. And so, and you know that Minnesota is, is one of the biggest um, state, you know, that is diversively growing. Mm -hmm. And we have massive influx of um, people from all over the country, you know, with non-English speaking um, um, residents. So how is this going to help to close the achievement gap? A couple of things to think about. Uh, in, in this last session, uh, we had some compensatory pilot grants that have been around for 10 years. Osseo School District and Anoka Hennepin School District have utilized those compensatory education pilot grants to actually close the achievement gap. 
when you look at, and I'm not going to pick on Minneapolis, but they're at about 56% is the achievement gap. But Nokia Hennepin fluctuates between 11 and 17%. Same thing with Osseo. They've closed the achievement gap because what they said was it's not concentration of poverty, but it's about the fact is if a child is coming with free and reduced, you know, and mm -hmm. comes from some part of poverty, yeah. that, that the child's going to have specific needs that need to be met. And the data is there, the data is there to do it. So when we brought the compensatory pilots in again this past session, because we lost them. Mm -hmm. At the end of the year, we lost them. I brought them back, and I was proud to bring them back because that was uh, $10 million statewide mm -hmm. that went to the districts that were showing they were doing it. The other thing is also when you look at the early childhood money, the $87 million new dollars that's mm -hmm. given, some of that was done in the form of scholarships. So that says to a family, if I want my kid to go to Kinder Care or Primrose or New Horizons, mm -hmm. and I meet the financial need that's out there, I can take my scholarship mm -hmm. and I can go. So what we do there is the early, the early childhood gets the achievement gap. And then what the cool thing is about this, in 2014, remember we passed all day, every day mm -hmm. kindergarten. Right. So 99.8% of kids in Minnesota all have a great start for kindergarten. So mm -hmm. if you can start getting the mm -hmm. basics in at an early age, by the time they're in kindergarten, they're ready for kindergarten mm -hmm. and they're ready to move. And we know the achievement gap's gonna close because of that. Absolutely, because you start from the basis, yep. right, which is kindergarten. Absolutely. That sounds great. Well, you, you also did talk about transportation, and that was very an interest to me because on 169, I travel on 169 a lot, and I see the congestion that is on there. And I also sometimes drive on one, uh, Highway 110, and you mentioned in the legislative report that, you, that the congestion in 169 w was also reached on, uh, I'm wondering whether it was reached on bipartisan basis because you did mention that there was an investment made in for, for that. Absolutely, and, and there's lots of investments that are being talked about. And I, I'm gonna go to Highway 10, for example. Highway okay. 10 is the most traveled road right now that we have in, uh, when you look at between 35W, 35V, yeah. Highway 10 mm -hmm. in the same stretch. Mm -hmm. and, and a gentleman named Elwin Tinklenberg, who is a former commissioner of transportation, talks about the, how much it's traveled. Armstrong Boulevard was a bill I brought in the, in the bonding, and it was a bipartisan bill, because bonding, you really need to get a super majority to, mm. a, to appreciate what's going on. It's right. regionally laid there. So Armstrong Boulevard, which is a new bypass that's, gonna, that's there, is also mm. there for some tra train safety issues. It's there because of the fact it's congestion that's building itself mm -hmm. all the way back to 169. Mm -hmm. The other thing is Highway 10 up to Hanson Boulevard is three lanes wide, and then after Hanson, it shrinks down to two lanes. Mm -hmm. So now you're in Coon Rapids, and you're down to two lanes. And, and we, we have some money that we're t hoping to get in bonding that, that opens up that congestion that gets another lane on Highway 10. The other thing, too, is um, looking at the, the infrastructure needs. We have, a, we have a rail safety problem, especially mm -hmm. in the northern metro area here. Mm -hmm. Hanson Boulevard is really super traveled, and there's always trains that are blocking the boulevard on Hanson, which then mm -hmm. stops our, our safety vehicles from getting around. And we've had real-time incidents occur. So if you look at Hanson, Sunfish, Ramsey, Armstrong, let's fix that stuff up, open up the congestion, it's there. Going down to 169 now, mm -hmm. that's going to help alleviate right. because a lot of people are flowing through 169. Mm -hmm. 169, what we had on the bonding was the, the dam, you know, the dam mm -hmm. that's on the mill pond. Mm -hmm. And that dam um, that I was able to bring with bipartisan support, it was Mark Uglum on the Republican side of the House and myself as a Democrat on the Senate side, brought that bonding bill piece to uh, our, our our community. Right. And that water that comes from the mill pond goes f directly into the Mississippi River. So you see all that construction that's mm -hmm. going around out there. Right. Since 1930, that water was regulated by 10 2 by 12s. So okay. imagine. And that created the opportunity for a 60-acre <laughs> floodplain, right. right? Absolutely. Having this dam put in there alleviates a 60-acre floodplain, gets the water back to where it is, and then as we start looking at cleaning up the mill pond, we'll get that back open as a fishery again. And I just recently brought another $2 million to the City of Champlin and the Legislative Citizens Commission for Minnesota Resources, which I also serve on as well. Mm -hmm. You know, that, as, as I listen to you, it brings to mind um, something that I read in you know, when they were opening the Highway 94, mm -hmm. okay, 94, I think 94 East, you know, when they were doing the opening, I knew that it affected some residents and businesses. How is that gonna affect, you know, how is what you're gonna do in 169 
and Highway 10, it, how do you think that is going to affect residents that live in that area? And is that going to also affect businesses? Well, it's going to alleviate the congestion that's on those roads that I talked about. And because um, there is right now, the, the train goes through in, in that area, there's mm -hmm. a, lots of families that live within a half mile of those, of those train tracks. Um, the bills that I have currently will not have any negative effects mm -hmm. on any houses because Highway 10 is already lower it's down so lower. and it's wide open. You can clear that lane and, and, and go with it. And then as far as affecting, it'll be short term for people that, um, you know, are used to traveling like mm -hmm. on Ramsey or, or uh, you know, Armstrong Boulevard, Armstrong. which Armstrong is down, but it'll be finished next year and then it'll be wide open. Okay. Plus people will have direct access to and from, which just north of there in, in Armstrong Boulevard, quarter mile north is a is a fire station. And there was a fire that happened and the fire department couldn't get to that car because the train was blocking the the, the, right. the, the right way to get there. So that's it. A couple other things I want to talk about sure, too. Yes. In bonding we also like um, uh, Brooklyn Park Armory. Mm -hmm. You know it's it's in need of repair and, and the, the veterans, yes. the folks came to me and said if we can l get you as a state to put in 1.24 million, we can leverage that for another 10 million. Oh. And so my bill passed, and and so hopefully we'll see some new construction happening within, you know, our own armory that's here as well. So sounds it, great. It, it is good. Yeah, a lot of um, new things are going on in Brooklyn Park, so that would be a little boost to Brooklyn Park. Yep. Yeah. Yep. My next question is concerning healthcare because you didn't talk about only transportation mm -hmm. and you know uh, education. You also shifted to healthcare. And this, I'm very much interested in knowing why that particular bill is in your 2015 legislation. You said you touch on investment for research in spinal cord and traumatic brain injuries. Is this a collaboration with the University of Minnesota, knowing that it's a research institution? And how is this going to be benefit the state's economy and the community as well? Absolutely. Matter of fact, the grant itself is running through the Office of uh, Higher Ed. Um, which makes sense, and it's going to open up uh, other research uh, facilities to be able to tap into because we have about 118,000 people that are living with traumatic brain injury and spinal cord mm -hmm. injuries right here in the state of Minnesota. And there's some great innovation going on at, at HCMC. There's a doctor who's got, he's been authored 60 times and he's been oh, wow. doing some amazing things. He actually testified with me uh, as well as did the University of Minnesota, and there's some great research that's happening at that institute as, as well as the Mayo Clinic has got another program. So hopefully those folks are all applying for the grants because mm -hmm. we're going to give that money to those types of institutions that are doing some innovative research that mm -hmm. we can now get some positive outcomes for people with uh, traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury. Mm -hmm. And so the other thing, too, is a, is a you know, in healthcare and human services, I brought the ABLE Act to Minnesota, mm -hmm. which then doesn't penalize people with developmental disabilities because mm -hmm. their asset limitation is there. The medical assistance spend down, especially for elderly people that are on elderly waivers or people with developmental disabilities, that they're not penalized. They have to spend down their money to 75% of poverty. I actually raised that to 80%. Oh. Still have to spend it down in order to get health insurance benefits. but. You know, fixing that a little bit puts about you know puts a little bit of money back in your pocket at the end of the day. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So looking at this, how do you think that is going to benefit the community and benefit the state? Absolutely. Well, it, both of those are going to are going to have impact because when you look at it, you know, one in five people in the state of Minnesota have some kind of there's some kind of disability that, that occurs. One in five. So you get twenty percent, and that mm -hmm. could be anything from asthma to to you know mm -hmm. name the spectrum. It's mm -hmm. there. Um, the other thing I did was was a co-author of, of an investment in finally people that are working with our elderly and people that are working with people with disabilities. Um, we did this 5% campaign two years ago mm -hmm. where we finally for the first time in seven years got a, you know a 5% increase in wages. Now it's nothing mm -hmm. compared to what you know wages are at but it was, a, it was a small way of saying thank you for the hard work you're doing on behalf of our elderly citizens and people with disabilities. Right. You did mention about the ABLE Act. Can we talk a little bit about the ABLE Act? Yeah, absolutely. we have a little more time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As, you, as you're looking at that, you know, when, when, you, when you look at the ABLE Act, the mm -hmm. um, legislation that families with disabilities can set up what is called a tax advantage um, account. It's similar to a 529 higher education account. And I did write about that a little bit. Yeah. And, and what that does is it allows that person not to be penalized, and, 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 and here's why. Mm -hmm. I had families come to me that said, we have a child who is on a waiver program. Mm -hmm. Grandpa and grandma want to put money aside for his future, but because he's on a waiver program, if they give him more than $2,000, then he loses his health care benefits, right? Yeah. $2,000, asset limitation. 
The federal government, and this was a large bipartisan bill that passed. Mm -hmm. President, President Obama signed it into law. It was bipartisan. It was Republicans and Democrats fully in, in on this thing, saying, that's not fair. You're going to keep people in poverty just because they have a disability. That's not right. okay. This mm -hmm. way it allows you to set up this 529 account, which is a, like a special needs trust account, and then it allows that individual not to be penalized, but to be able to use that. So if the individual needs some, some adaptive something, right? Mm -hmm. Needs right. to get, you know, a vehicle or needs something, mm -hmm. that parent and, and, and grandparents, those folks can put up to $100,000 and, and know that, that it's not going to affect his, a, his asset limitation. Right. That's important because let's say I needed a special needs or a, a, a vehicle that mm -hmm. was adaptive for me to be able to get on and get off, right? right. And I don't have all this health insurance oh, money yeah. to do it. I could tap into those assets mm -hmm. and pay for that and not be penalized. Mm -hmm. That's important. The federal government side, we were one of the first five states to actually, actually I think one of the first three states to actually do it. But I brought that bill to Minnesota, was proud to chief author that and run that thing through. Right. Wow. That's a boost for the state. Well, yeah, that's, yeah. And it says to, you know, when you're looking at some folks that are going to be on some kind of waivered service program that, you know what, we, we are thinking about you, for, finally, finally, finally thinking about you. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I, I think that's big. So do you think that is um, part of the Affordable Care Act? Was it, was it part of it in there? Is it a subset within the fo uh, Affordable it was a whole Care separate, Act? It was a whole separate bill. Mm -hmm. the, the Affordable Care Act, you know, was saying that people have to have access to mm -hmm. health care insurance. Right. And this was saying... Um, you're not going to lose your health care insurance because you have an asset limitation right. piece. So finally cutting that asset limitation, say no, you put set up a 529 account mm -hmm. and then you can maintain those and, and you can be assured of some safety and stability in your life as, as you mm -hmm. get older. Right. Uh, and you know, nothing to do with the, uh, the uh, affordable. Uh, affordable Care, care Act, Act at all. It was a whole separate bill. The Affordable Care Act, you know, there, the Affordable Care Act did say to people with disabilities and people in elderly waiver services that um, you had to spend Spe down to yeah. 75 percent. Yeah. Right? Yeah, right. And like, that was the only, there's the only group that had to do that where everybody <laughs> else could get up to 133 percent of right. poverty in order to say, I just went, wait a minute, who thought this thing <laughs> up? So, right. And that's why I fixed it a little bit. Yeah, that's very nice. Well, Senator, you know, you've been in office for the longest. Yeah. And so. I'm wondering if you're still considering running again or whether that you've done so much, you know you've accomplished a lot for the state of Minnesota, maybe it's about time to retire. Are it, you thinking that way? It, it's funny you say that because <laughs> I, I, I've only been in there since 2012. That's the, 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 the piece. Was, I, I was told when I, when I first got in there, I, um, you know, I came from my education background, and right. uh, if we needed to do some fixes in education, which we did, and, and we still got a long way to go on some of them. Same thing with the, with the health care industry. Mm -hmm. MA spend down needs to be fixed. Asset limitations need to be fixed. We still have marriage penalties in the state of Minnesota that says if you have a disability and you marry somebody else with a disability and you're both on Social mm -hmm. Security, you're going to lose the benefits. One of you is going to lose those benefits. Mm -hmm. So that's an issue between the federal government and the state uh, of Minnesota. And so we need to fix those pieces. I mean, right. that, that all has to be put into play. Compensatory education, instead of fighting every two years for that $10 million, let's get that put in to uh, uh, the, the, the money should be put into the formula and stayed there, right? Right. Then Osseo School District and Anoka Hennepin School District can finally take uh, what they know is working and get it done. Then I'd like to see that actually get expanded statewide. So it's not just based on a concentration of poverty right. formula, but rather it's based upon the unique needs of that individual child Absolutely. that's coming to you and making sure that you're having good, solid um, curriculum right. with a great teacher and, and helper to be able to, to push Succeed. that forward. Mm -hmm. and, and we know it works in, in our two school districts right here, mm -hmm. uh, both in Osseo and in Oak Hennepin. Those are important things to keep going forward. Absolutely. You know, we got to fix the mill pond. We got to fix, look what we did in si Highway 610. When I became my first year, we opened up the corridors of commerce. We were able to give money to the corridors of commerce. The governor, that was $83 million that was given in order for Highway 610 to get to get finished. Mm -hmm. And remember our former mayor, Steve Lampy, years ago he always said, we gotta get 610 going and people will come. You build it and people will come. So I was proud to be able to say yes mm -hmm. and vote yes to get that 80, 83 million, it was 83 million, mm -hmm. in order to get corridors of commerce to finish 610. Mm -hmm. That's an important piece, that's, that's structurally important. balanced. Right. The only thing that's gonna be coming up too is the discussion of the blue line, right? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Our generation and older now? is saying no, or the generation <laughs> under us is saying yes, so right. we're still waving that thing out, but the fact is we wanted to get 
right there to have that conversation so we know that people are talking about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that is what motivates you. I'm motivated. I, you know what? I enjoyed, I enjoy, I think I, I've done a, uh, I think in the first three years in here, you know, uh, we've done some stuff uh, right. for our communities and, and we've, we've, we've really delivered for the suburbs up here in the north and I look mm -hmm. at the projects that, that passed in Bonnie. M the thing with the Champlain Mill Pond, mm -hmm. first time in the history of the city of Champlain that any bonding money was ever given to that city. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Think about that. How ever. many years? Ever. Everybody else gets bonding money, but not, not the city. It was kind of funny. I went, oh, wow. So. That is really. Yes, so I'm going to run again in 2016. Absolutely, and I'm there with you. I'm going to be <laughs> with you. I'm going to be right there with you. You're you know, funny. so <laughs> I like what you're doing. You, 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 are, you have been very positive all this while. Very positive. You Thank know. you. And, and I like yeah. positive people. I like yeah. what you're doing. You don't think about yourself. You don't, you don't really, you know, you think about, you, you are out of the box. You think about everybody, yeah. not just you. Thank you. So the next question I want to ask you is, so with all these legislat legislations and all these good things you've done, we are in December. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon we are crossing to 2016. Yep. What is your agenda? What is your plan? What is the next step? You know, the, that's a great question because as we're looking at, this is a bonding year, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. And we just got, remember the, the, the state budget forecast was... Uh, we now have a $1.87 $1 billion reserve, right? Right. Part of that money has to go, not reserve, a uh, plus in the budget forecast, right? Mm -hmm. So surplus, Absolutely. that's the word I'm looking Absolutely. for, surplus. We have to take some of that money and put it in the reserve because for years, everybody just shifted. Remember the, the problem with the school shift, the mm -hmm. $2.6 I don't Absolutely. ever want to see that happen again. Let's make sure we have money in the reserves to take care of that mm -hmm. problem. Let's make sure that we're investing that money back into our communities, back into our school districts that we've neglected for 10 years, back mm -hmm. into the health and human services field that we've neglected for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Let's get that stuff back so that we're back to being number one, which mm -hmm. we're pretty doggone close. I think mm -hmm. we're one, two, and three in lots of different yeah. areas, right? Yeah. But besides that, um, all those bills that I talked about, my 2015 report, because it's a two-year cycle, 15, 16, mm -hmm. so all those bonding bills that I have sitting out there with the Mill Pond, with Highway 10, mm -hmm. Hanson Boulevard, mm -hmm. Sunfish Boulevard, Ramsey, mm -hmm. forgot to mention Oliver Kelly Farm. Oh. That was a bill of mine that got passed. It was $13 million to help, you know, uh, fix the Oliver Kelly Let's Farm. Let's talk about that, too. <laughs> well, yeah, that was, that was in 2014 when it passed, and they're already building it. They're already fixing it. So, and that every child in, in our area would go out to this. This is the original Oliver Kelly Farm. This is an old farm that's still there. It, it's right on Highway 10. Mm -hmm. So in Anoka, Hennepin, the 23 elementary schools all use that. I know everyone in the Osseo School District drove up there and used that Oliver mm -hmm. Kelly farm to see what was it like to actually watch a cow, you know, right. plow a field. Absolutely. I mean, the, yeah. and everything. There's no electricity. The oh. water's pumping. Yeah, you want to go out there and take a look at yeah, it? Absolutely. We should go out there and like do a ride. show. We should take a ride and just go over there. And Let's do a show out there. Let's go show. on the road. I yeah. love it. I like you to see what's going on it's, there and it's bring very, it out there to the public. And it's educational, especially if you get kids from, from this area that are out there. It's just amazing. Sure. So when, it, when it gets we built, take we'll a, do that. Yeah, we should I'm go in. on there for a trip. I'm in. And then do a coverage and bring it out there and show people here's what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Amazing absolutely. stuff. It is amazing because it's, it brings a real, real life education and mm -hmm. history to a child who gets to watch a, a horse that is, you know, on a, on a treadmill right. that, you know, yeah. that's really, and, and, they're, and they're doing their chafing of the wheat or whatever they're doing with yeah. the, the bundles and the hay creating, <laughs> you know, chopping up the hay. And, <laughs> and then, you know, yeah. I remember my daughter coming home when she was real young and said, you know, they actually made us work out there. They, they picked <laughs> the wheelbarrow up and, you know, went and fed the goats and the pigs and stuff. Yeah. It was like, it's funny. It's funny. It's good stuff. Though. Yeah. 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 Wow, that has been amazing. You know, um, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about your district. Your mm -hmm. district is, part of your district is in Brooklyn Park, yep. is that correct? 36? Yep, yep 36 is mm -hmm. 85th, so 85th, everything north of 85th from, you know, 169 or Jefferson Highway over to the mm -hmm. river and you go all the way up to mm -hmm. Champlin, all mm -hmm. the way through Champlin. Mm -hmm. It's all part of the district and then a little, a little tab, a quarter size of, of uh, Coon Rapids going across the river right mm -hmm. there. So. Uh, and the southern part of Brooklyn Park, of course, uh, Chris Eaton represents right. that. So there are two right. senators that represent Brooklyn Park. And she's got a little bit of Brooklyn Center as well. But, right. but that's, uh, that's how it lays out. Yeah, and I know that you know that there's a massive influx of people from particularly the western part of Africa. We mm -hmm. have the Liberian community, yep. um, Ghanaian community, Nigerian community. And we also have a huge um, Hmong community yep. also coming in. And they keep coming in. Yep. So I'm wondering, what do you have in mind for the next coming year for these um, 
you know, group of people. I'm glad you brought that up because I did. I, I passed. It's healthy children, ha healthy moms, healthy babies. It was okay. money that was given, and it's the um, uh, an organization, uh, Isarun organization, oh. and that's the uh, Somalian women that that run this. And it's really it's a maternal child health. It's really yeah. about you know health. nutrition, mm -hmm. health, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also it's re reaching out to mm -hmm. Oramia, mm -hmm. which we have the largest Oramia population. Right. Absolutely. You know the Oromo folks yeah. are from Ethiopia. The yeah. Oramia, we have the largest right here in Brooklyn mm -hmm. Park. Yeah. And and you know that that's important to, to connect those mm -hmm. because that's what's important. Mm -hmm. Healthy kids, you know, healthy start. Right. What's nutrition? What do I need? Do I have access to mm -hmm. the to the right perinatal and the access to the right, you know, um, the baby doc. Right. You know, well, that right. that's there right. as well. Um, then you know, yeah, we do have the second largest Hmong mm -hmm. community right. uh, in the in the Twin Cities yes, is, is right here in our area mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. it is diversified. Very it's diversified. beautiful. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I mean, you go Jackson Middle School. There must be ninety different languages that are being <laughs> spoken at Jackson Middle School, and yeah. and you see that. And I think that's enriching because Minnesota, it goes all the way back to when the you know the Norwegians and the Swedes were coming over <laughs> here to farm, right? And it's right. just like you keep coming. This yeah. is great. This is yeah. you know keep it up. Yeah. Um, more and more so on the health and human services side, mm -hmm. but but really my target has been the early childhood and the all day everyday childhood. kindergarten because mm -hmm. that's really important to make mm -hmm. sure that we get the basis. Uh, the basis. It's right. there. You got yeah. a kid who just came over here right. from Russia. We got Russians. You know, I'm a third generation yeah. Russian. My mm -hmm. grandfather came from Odessa, Russia. Right. And and so. But but for kiddos that are just coming over right now, what are we doing early childhood? With and the that's education, why with your health care. Huge. Yeah. It's there. It's mm -hmm. big. And that's why the programs that, that I think we've done the last three years mm -hmm. has the Senate majority and the DFL have, have just been above and beyond. And mm -hmm. I think we need to keep that momentum going mm -hmm. and, and we're gonna assure that we're gonna close the achievement gap. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced mm -hmm. because of our, our key investments yeah. in early childhood, our key investment in all day everyday kindergarten and our key investment in mm -hmm. keeping education free appropriate public education alive in Minnesota, mm -hmm. it's gonna pay off. Yeah. You know, we only have two minutes left and uh, I like to, you know, tell you that um, I like you to keep in mind that we we continuously get getting very diverse. You know, mm -hmm. it's getting very so diverse and we have to start thinking about all and I'm glad that you already have those people in your mind you mm -hmm. know and I think that I would like to bring you back on here so we can talk more about immigrant economy Absolutely. to the state of Minnesota and how is that boosting and you know there's a Dr. Bruce Corey at, at the University of Concordia who, who actually has put together um, he calls it Little Africa, and he put together a financial study. Maybe we should get him on we with should get me him here too. And, and really look at the financial impact. And mm -hmm. he started in Brooklyn Park, and he rolls it all the way down through the Midway. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, the financial impact that, that, that the immigrants, the immigrant uh, populations have had mm -hmm. positive beyond about. I mean, this guy, it's amazing. You'll go, wow. That's what you'll be saying <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> Senator, take 30 minutes, 30 seconds, and just say, tell, tell you know, can you say something to you know our audience concerning where we're going from here? You know, I I, I really have enjoyed this conversation with Roberta Martin, and, and thank you for listening to me, and thank you for listening to what what I think are, are huge accomplishments uh, within our our district and also the state of Minnesota, and and I like the idea of of continuing this conversation as we look at yeah closing that achievement gap, yeah making sure that health care is accessible for everybody in the state of Minnesota, making sure that our populations are ready to go that are here, including those early childhood kiddos. So, uh, you know, Roberta, I want to thank you very much for having me on. And I took less than 30 seconds, but yes, it's, been, it's been such a pleasure it's to a talk pleasure. to you. Really, absolutely. Senator, it's been great having thank you, you, too. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. you, absolutely. I know you are, it's, you, know, you are a very busy person, but I'm glad you made it. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. With that said, good night.